Blockbusters. I used to spend countless hours wandering the aisles of Physical Game Pass trying to pick out something to rent for the weekend. It was a big deal, after school on a Friday I'd be there and then the gut-wrenching sadness on Sunday night when I had to return it. Nothing was as stomach-churning though as this one game I used to avoid because the box art just scared me too much. The Suffering. Man, this used to terrify me to the point of avoiding eye contact with the guy screaming on the case, but I couldn't help sneak a peek because I just found it so intriguing. Alas, the golden age of radio has passed us by. This must be the scariest game of all time, I thought to myself, but I was too chicken shit to even pick it up. And I'd forgotten all about it until someone in the comments reminded me of the trauma. It's all coming back! It's all coming back! I hate you! It's all coming back! You understand? Yeah, thanks for that. But here I am now at the age of 28, and one would assume I'm no longer a little bitch, so I picked up the game on PC cheaper than it ever was at Blockbuster to give it a go. Released in 2004 for the PS2, Xbox and PC, The Suffering was developed by Surreal Software and published by Midway Games. A horror shooter that definitely feels like a product of its time, an experimental game in how it tries to advance with the times by taking various gameplay styles and packing them into one package in an attempt to make something unique. Surreal Software only had three credits prior to making The Suffering, a game called Draken and its sequel, followed by movie tie-in game Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring. Therefore I think it's safe to say Surreal Games at the time were looking to make a name for themselves and have an impact in the gaming market by standing out of the crowd in a time that saw many new high profile games launching on what are arguably some of the greatest consoles of all time. I mean, some of the most memorable games of all time released in 2004, I mean just look at this lineup. To think all of these games came out in the same year, it was definitely a time to be alive. Yet despite its competition, The Suffering was a commercial success selling over 1.5 million units and it would have been one more if it wasn't for little chicken shit me. So I think it's safe to say I had a misconception of this game from when it was released. I was under the impression The Suffering was a horror game first and foremost, but it's pretty difficult to be scared when playing as a hard ass Tommy gun wielding child killer that takes action first and asks questions, well, never. We play as Talk, a man of the house who has been sentenced to death for the killing of his own wife and two children, and whilst Talk denies this and claims he blacked out, a convenient way of not giving us the plot in the first two minutes I do have to say, Talk does not remember the murders, but the evidence is indisputable. The story starts with Talk being escorted down the Green Mile into a cell to await his execution for the crimes he may or may not have committed. Nice to meet you, my name's Floyd. How long you got to get turned on the table, huh? You all out of appeals? Your lawyer, fuck you. But events turn from shit to shittier when the prison is overrun by strange monsters ripping and tearing both inmates and officers. CO! CO! What the hell's going on? Straight from the start line, we we're introduced to a bunch of inmates, and whilst they do not last past the five minute mark, it gave me a pretty accurate first impressions of the tone of the game and the characters I would meet along the way. And let me tell you why this game is not what I expected and that I wouldn't call it your traditional horror. That doesn't mean it is any less horrific. And if I did happen to play this when I was a kid, I don't think I would have been playing it very long. My parents would have certainly seen to that. Will you shut the fuck up, you baby-raping, sodomizing sack of shit! I was just asking the man a question, Goose. Whoa! It's like the start of a joke, a rapist, a pedo and a Nazi walk into a cell, except we never get the punchline as they are slaughtered one by one by an unseen foe. I was quite surprised all of these characters died so quickly due to the immediate characterization of them. Within a few seconds we knew who was who thanks to the honestly pretty good writing. Stereotypical in its character types, yes, I mean you've got the religious nut, that Nazi figure and the guy who seems to be pretty switched on and you wonder why he's even in here in the first place, but it all did what it needed to do. Never thought I'd say this, but I was kind of gutted they killed off the rapist, the pedo and the Nazi too soon. Ten more minutes would have been nice. There's your punchline. Now alone, talk doesn't speak in the game, however I think overall it works at adding a sense of isolation and mystery to the character, and with the game's multiple endings based on player choice. Most of what we learn about talk comes from the opinions of others, and it paints a pretty picture as to his infamy within the those who have been caught and banged up community. Word has travelled about talk's crimes, and it lays the foundation of our story and poses the question in our mind, is everything about the whole ordeal really as it seems? I feel they do use a silent protagonist here as a means to make the story a mystery, as if he could talk then it would be over within the first five minutes along with the pedo, the rapist and the Nazi, so I guess it is a convenient way of doing it, but it works. And the answers to the questions we are looking for are the most interesting part of this story in that the answers are entirely up to the player through the game's pretty cool morality system. The game does have three endings depending on the choices throughout the game, good, evil or neutral. The outcomes are based on your ability to protect and help survivors as you progress through the prison, 
and these could be other inmates or COs, and most on first impressions would trust a blood-covered boxing glove wearing kangaroo before they would trust talk. The scum who killed his own wife and children? Wipendale, huh? Why you do it? You going to kill me too? Come on and make kill me, I dare you! Kill him before he kills you. Wait, he's just confused. So it turns out you don't have the cojones to kill me when you have the chance. You fucking inmate. With little choice and options though, we do occasionally team up with a number of different characters to assist them in escaping or surviving. With regards to our options, we have two. Either fight against our urges and help them, or just straight up whack them in a good old fashioned prison shanking. Hold it right there or I will cut you down. You hear me inmate? Do you hear me? Give him a chance. Kill him. Ah, to God hell with protocol. Him. Everything's gone to shit. Watch that inmate or I will fuck you up. I could never love a murderer. We have the devil and angel morality system in that we have one on each shoulder. Talk as a character is presented as someone who, putting it lightly, has mental issues and a part of that are the voices we hear which act to help us in the choices we make and showing that Talk is nuttier than a pool of melted Snickers. Talk's wife acts as the good karma whilst evil actions appease to a more demonic voice as we give in to our darker urges. For my first playthrough I decided to go for the good ending and help those along the way which pleases Talk's wife, at least in his mind. Don't let the bastards keep you down! Set him free, T. Going for a good karma playthrough though, I actually found to be the most difficult way to play the game as it comes with a bunch of escort style objectives, and thanks to the terrible AI, these are the real suffering. <laughs> One sequence had me in the showers with a fellow prisoner fighting off constant hordes of enemies and my companion would just continually back himself into the corner and I could only do so much as I was busy protecting myself. This took me about 5 tries to get through this due to having to start the sequence over and over again because he would just die and eventually I managed to beat it just by running through and by luck he followed me rather than fighting the monsters. With these escort missions also come repeated dialogue which really gets on my friggin nerves when characters just say the same thing over and over again. If we can just get through these gates, they lead right out of prison! You can safe, man! On Torque, you gotta get this gate open! You just can't leave me hanging! And if we can just get through these gates, they lead right out of prison! We'd be safe, man! Honestly, it would have just been a lot less painful to pick up the soap. Boom. Another time I was helping a guy protect his raft from some enemies that were only killable using explosives or a melee weapon, and a couple of times he'd blow himself up with dynamite. So I guess I'll just be taking that raft then. Whilst most of the time it's pretty obvious as to what was the good thing to do and the bad, there were a few times in which the screen would flash with the demonic presence and say something that made me think I did something wrong. However, it wasn't ever clear as to what that was, which was pretty annoying, especially when I was trying to do a perfect good karma run. Even now, I'm not sure if I actually did something wrong, or if it was just the game's attempt at giving me a cheap jump scare. Either way, it didn't work. Helping other survivors though does have its benefits in that it brings on scenarios and character interactions that are pretty enjoyable. There was one particular time where we bumped into a group of prisoners who had beef. Prisoners that all had the same inmate number, but... <laughs> and it resulted in a classic prison yard fight. Something I would imagine would happen, even though the end of the world is happening at our feet. Just, yeah, I fucked you up, Chico. Bring that shit. I just felt a lot of these scenarios would have been far less troublesome by avoiding the topic of shit AI altogether by just taking them out instantly. When talk isn't accompanied by other living people, though, it is an isolated place with the only conversation being through the ghosts of the past. Daddy, help me daddy. Talk has many visions of his family's demise and takes a lot of abuse from his wife and kids in that he failed to be a good father and husband and this game is Talk's redemption tale if you want it to be. You can't be a father in jail, I can't bring Corey here to visit you or the new one. It's better if they just forget. It doesn't stop with his family though as we have the power to see and hear the thoughts of previous inmates. These are pretty freaking crazy in themselves and let me tell you one thing I loved about the game was the voice acting. To the point where some of the glimpses into the past occupants actually made me feel a little uncomfortable in just how sick they were and what they were implying. That little girl wasn't so innocent after I was done. These happen occasionally throughout the game and really do give a detailed look into the mind of a psychopath. 
And this is the real horror of the suffering. The game is at its best when it explores the dark side of the human mind. A lot of stuff that to be honest probably would have gone straight over my head as a kid, but playing this now, the themes it portrays here are dark, but great to see unfold if you can stomach it. And it is a terrifying representation of how men can become monsters. I always looked at their bodies when I was done. And it is those monsters that choke on the barrel of our boomsticks. The game is comprised of 20 chapters and takes place in Abbott State Penitentiary on Carnot Island where we battle the evil. Evil incarnate? Get it. Evil incarnate means to be the manifestation of evil and that is exactly what is going on in this prison island and has always been throughout history. Prison, the island experienced more stages in history than a friggin museum, primarily noted as a Nazi base during World War II, amongst other things like hosting witch trials. The island is split into various sections, the main prison is a reoccurring location. Here we explore wards and cells, dark corridors, destroyed recreational areas, guard quarters, execution chambers. There is a quarry, living quarters, a cave system, graveyards, and my personal favourite, an asylum for the insane. <laughs> come in, please, you come in. Yes, come in, I will walk you up. Name is Sergei. Oh, wait, are you really there? The levels are linear in that we usually have to just get from point A to B, however every location feels natural in its connectivity from the previous one and to the island as a whole. Shortcuts and alternate paths are available at some points to give the player a choice and direction, and the geometry of the game world all interlinks together. For example, later in the game I came back to the prison through a locked door I had long forgotten about, and with that a sense of excitement came from the feeling of everything coming full circle. So the level design in that regard is pretty cool, and what I loved about the locations is the history and lore it gives us through the spirits and memories we encounter. We learn of previous officers, prisoners and residents of the island, and this place has always been evil incarnate. As for the aesthetic, it gave me a very strong vibe of the movie Shutter Island if that were to be set in Silent Hill, in that the island is a place to torment any visitors with the evil deeds they have committed, and this made, for the most part, a very interesting location for the game. However, there were a few sections I found less interesting than others. The quarry, for example, whilst it came with some environmental puzzles in an attempt to keep it fresh, such as moving cranes and using dynamite to create paths, it was visually boring, as were the caves with everything looking very similar and bland. In these sections I was looking forward to moving on, however other areas were acceptable. The asylum and prison itself for example were great and I loved the design of them with the prison graffiti, the details and the gruesome carnage that the place was great, and although none of it was ever particularly scary it all had a foreboding atmosphere to it. The asylum is the most creative area in that it felt like a small maze within itself which added a nice change of pace to the game. Doors are blocked by projections of gates and in order to progress through I needed to find and destroy the projectors displaying these images which were often hidden. This was accompanied by one of the more compelling characters in the game, a doctor who is intrigued by Tork's animalistic nature and wishes to experiment on him. In fact as we progress through the levels there are three or four main character ghostly apparitions that communicate with, the ca with Tork. One particular character including us finally giving someone peace by finishing them off in the electric chair, it was quite a heartfelt moment that was not expected. I think we got something in common. We know what love is. We know what it is to love a woman. You do anything for it. Am I right? And something else we got. We know what it is to lose it. Lose it all. To not be in control. Stop it. Stop me. I can't even remember what I was in here for. Thank you. We also have a few boss fights, one against an angry cowboy looking CO who has waited for his time to take his hatred out on the prisoners as he fights you with a turret. For a human he takes a hell of a lot of bullets and at first I thought it was a bit tricky trying to get close to him until after I killed him I found out you could go upstairs and then drop into the room with him. It would have been good for me to find that before I fought him but hey ho eventually he come out and you can unload all the lead you like into him until he dies. I mentioned earlier that the suffering felt to me like an experiment in that it combines two popular gameplay styles in an attempt to make something unique and those are first person and third person shooters in a horror setting which leads me to the gameplay. At the press of a button we can switch from first or third person and both modes are adequately tuned to allow both styles to be an option for the whole game should you choose, but I found both options preferable at different points in the game for different reasons. Regardless of your moral compass throughout, the aim of the game is to break out of the shithole of a prison, insanity intact optional, through a series of levels. Once the opening cutscene finished, I was still in the mindset that this was a survival horror game and the first weapon I found was the classic prison essential, the shiv. <laughs> 
Taking this and a bunch of pills for healing Max Payne style, we set on our merry way as I encountered a guard who appeared to have a splitting headache. Dum the quieter sections of the game have you exploring the corridors of the prison, searching rooms for pills, batteries for your flashlight you locate on a corpse, and opening cells and doors to navigate through the prison. And it comes with some pretty intense combat that keeps it exciting for most of the game. The first creature, and the most common foe I faced was the Slayer. With blades for arms and legs, and if you look closely enough, its head is detached from its body, symbolising decapitation. With nothing but a shiv, I took this thing out with a couple of free slash combos in third person. This is quite an overpowered move in that I did find the shiv or fire axe killed these monsters in less strikes than it took bullets. Which I did find strange, it seemed to me that the damage dealt with different weapon types did need some reconfiguring during development. Move to first person with the shiv and there is only one slash, making this mode inferior to taking out anything with melee attacks due to the even more limited moveset to the already pretty limited third person moves. And this was the first instance in a bunch where I felt the discrepancies between the two perspectives which I'll get to shortly. Now after our first kill we are given our first moral choice to either help this guard get out or kill him for his revolver. If you do wait a short enough time you will get the gun anyway as he dies by electrocution and you do get the revolver. Using this six shot shooter against the slayers I quickly learn that shooting off their heads, the norm for these types of games as removing the head usually removes all threat, did not phase them in the slightest seeing as their heads were detached anyway. A pretty cool detail. Speaking of cool details, the enemy designs throughout the game are absolutely brilliant and is alone something pretty special. There are 8 standard enemy types in the game not including the bosses and villains with each one being gratifyingly gruesome in their creation. Every one of the creatures are intricately designed based on various different forms of execution history has suffered. The Slayer, as previously mentioned, is a very mobile enemy that can climb up walls, crawl along ceilings, meaning they can come at you from multiple directions and they are pretty fast and can be difficult to get a shot on them when they are moving about. However, they do seem to sometimes just stand there asking to be shot due to poor programming. These guys though are usually accompanied by another form of monstrosity, so they are what I would call the default soldier to just fill up the line on the shooting range. Speaking of a shooting range, the next bad guy we get is the Marksman. Do it! Fucking do it! Just fucking kill me! These huge meaty boys tower over you and are the largest enemy in the game, however size doesn't mean much when they can be put down pretty easily. A representation of victim and executioner in a firing squad, these guys have a big meat sack on their backs that contains a rotating turret with four rifles attached to it. At first glance you could say game over man, game over, but as long as you are not standing still and have the room to sidestep around them in a circle, you should get away without being scratched as you feed them a few rounds. Who said size mattered eh? Now in chapter 4 we meet what are perhaps the most annoying little fuckers I have encountered in a game recently and these are the mainliners. Representation of the most current form of execution, the lethal injection. These small hunched up creatures spawn out of pools of water or blood, so you can usually tell when they are going to be present, however they usually come in small groups and like the slayer, are usually back up. Having green filled liquid syringes in their backs, they can throw these at you or more annoyingly pounce on you for a close up facial. They also present an environmental danger in that when you kill them they leave a pool of their green blood which harms you if you walk through it. This was often a threat in tight interiors and they are pretty quick to kill once they're in your line of sight, but kill enough of them in small spaces their presence still lingers through their damaging blood. Both in that the blood hurts you and it's a new pool for more cretins to spawn through. As if the prison's shower floors weren't sticky enough. Upon a second playthrough I did learn to my annoyance that the shower level of constant waves of these mainliners would be avoided once I turned off the shower, something that went completely over my head but as frustrating as these guys are, that's good game design. A few times their appearance came from an environmental puzzle of some sort, for example to progress here I had to put out a fire and to do so I had to flood the room which allowed the bastards to spawn in through the water. We also have the Noosemen, the easiest of the malefactors to avoid, and these guys represent hanging, but more specifically the prison COs who are lynched by inmates for revenge following a cave-in in the mines, which killed some inmates. Visible by pools of blood on the ceiling, the only way for these guys to get you is by walking under these blood spots for them to drop down and grab you, limiting their presence to interior levels only. You can taunt them out by quickly dipping under the spot and then taking them out with a well-placed blast of the shotgun. 
Connected to the story of the cave-in, we have the burrows representing being buried alive, and these guys are a little tricky as they traverse underground. And once out of the ground, they have a number of attacks, including a spinning attack with their chains that got me a few times. You can get them to flop over though with a well-timed shotgun shell or a swing from the fire axe. They do become incapacitated and you can take free reign on them to ensure they never emerge from the ground again. One level had me finding an old slave ship and this introduced the festers and festering rats. The festers are large bloated slave traders that represent being eaten alive by the rats. Wearing a metal brace, bullets are useless against these foes as they do just ricochet off, making most weapons useless against them. Explosives or melee weapons are the way to go, although the melee may not be ideal if there are a few of them as one heavy attack from their ball and chain can kill you in one strike. I soon found bombs followed by a Molotov cocktail was the best way to go, as once killed by that initial explosive, a swarm of rats bursts out of its stomach. These rats do appear a few times via this method or just on their own, and with a quick spray of the Tommy gun or a well-thrown Molotov, this will ensure the pest control team can have the day off. Our final standard enemy, which makes its appearance pretty late in the game, are the Infernus. Has the devil trapped you? You're not a bad man. You have to believe. First giving off the appearance of innocent young girls, a form that anyone who's played any horror game before will know these cute little doll faces need exterminating before they can scream for their mummy. The least common, but by far the most difficult of the enemies to kill. In their human form, they cannot actually be harmed, probably because running around killing young children may be frowned upon, but once close enough, they will erupt into flaming creatures, representing those being burned alive at the island's historic witch trials. Their primary direct attack is a flaming ball thrown at you, however, like the main liners, it is the environment environmental damage they inflict that make them a tough foe. Strategic in their methods, a couple of these infernos will circle you, creating pits of fire that cause heavy damage if contact is made with the flames. They make for a pretty chaotic fight, one encounter had me rescuing a couple of inmates from a cave. Don't worry, we're still safe from those girls. There was fire every, it was a tricky task to keep everyone alive, which I eventually did after a few attempts. Now I know I've spent a bit of time talking about the various enemy types, but for me this is one of the game's core strengths. Many games have creative or over-the-top monster designs, however they don't always fit within the game world in a meaningful way, but here in The Suffering, each creature is painstaking in its design and the lore behind them. The game has an encyclopedia of sorts for the creatures and locations, and each one makes sense within the world created here by Surreal Games. Each monster introduction gave me a hesitant smile and I always eagerly anticipated the next. And when there are a variety of these guys coming at you at once, it makes for some pretty cool gameplay. And the act of taking out these beautiful bastards is kept entertaining throughout the roughly 6-8 to eight hour playthrough. However, the combat and gameplay is where the game's inconsistencies come from its design. Going back to that first and third person perspective transition, this is the selling point for the gameplay, but it does have a few discrepancies. Perhaps intentional, but more likely to both budget and technical restraints. Third person talk maneuverability is far quicker paced when running and gunning, as the movement speed felt quicker than in first person. So playing in third person allows for me to evade larger groups of enemies and help with observing my surroundings naturally. However, shooting those enemies is a lot easier in first person, so flipping between the two in combat is something I had to adjust to pretty early on for an effective offence. However, what I did find strange is that whilst Talk in third person is faster in movement, he takes his sweet ass time with interacting with the game world. Opening doors, lockers, pushing buttons and other interactables have a physical motion with talk, actually interacting with whatever object you are interacting with. However, when searching the 20th locker, this can grow a little tedious sitting through the animation. In comparison though, the first person mode eliminates all of these physical interactions. Picking up items, opening doors and lockers, it is all done hands-free, which makes item scavenging and exploration quicker and more fluid feeling. Whilst I do appreciate the effort going into making the third person character motions more believable, I felt it sometimes negatively affected the pacing of the game when the first person option was available and more desirable. Third person does though have its visually pleasing benefits in that if I kill a swarm of enemies, Talk's character model gets covered in more blood than Carrie on Prom Night. I like to think it represented Talk's mindset, either covered in guilt from killing his family and inhabitants on the island, or not symbolic at all and he is just covered in blood as he enjoys all the killing, however you want to see it. We do have this effect as well in first person on the weapons we are holding which is a nice feature, but nothing beats the increasing amount of blood on Talk's whole body as we make those against us suffer. Now actually whilst I do prefer third person games, I did find combat in the suffering is slightly more favourable in first person, but the simple fact that I could change between the two added far more variety and enjoyment in the combat than I thought it would. 
I expected to stick to one, but shifting between the two actually managed to make it feel consistently fresh, even if the character model and movements weren't consistent. Our form of executing these foes come in a variety of guns, some of which I have touched upon already, but this is also where some discrepancies come in terms of damage output and reload animations. The weapons do control well enough, none of them really having any crazy recoil or even different sized reticles, but each were effective for different scenarios. You got your revolvers which can be dual wielded, a shotgun, a tommy gun, flamethrower, various throwables such as a flashbang grenade, dynamite and cocktails, and a shiv and fire axe. I mentioned earlier the melee weapons feel overpowered and that goes for both the shiv and fire axe as they kill enemies quicker than most guns do, however that is assuming you can get close enough to get in the required hits. My favourite and most used weapon of the game was the shotgun as it's always good to keep these handy. But as for the number of rounds it takes to kill each enemy, varied in a weird way like the slayer for example, sometimes 3 hits were enough to kill it, some other times it took the whole chamber. These discrepancies made it unpredictable to a certain degree, but more than anything it made the damage output seem random and in some cases broken, which I did find a little annoying and tedious, but luckily enough there is enough ammo to go around as I never found myself dangerously low. Bearing in mind I was playing on normal difficulty, and this does likely change the higher you go up, but regardless, why is there so much ammo lying around on the floor and in lockers of a prison complex? It was the definition of a gun crazy's candy store. Reload animations as well were the biggest gripe for me in terms of the guns. While some weapons like the Tommy gun take one clip, others like the revolver and shotgun take individual shells and the reload does not reflect the amount of ammo used. The shotgun for instance fire just one round or all seven, regardless the reload animation would have Torque always inserting four rounds before pumping for the reload. Beneficial if you've used all 7 rounds, but a pain in the ass if you've fired just one and you have to wait for the prolonged reload. A copy and paste reload animation every time no matter how many shells you used. But again I guess this could be put down to budget or technical restraints for the time this game is made. Something else that doesn't quite add up is the creatures supposedly do not like the light and we should be safe within it, but this is not always the case. At a couple of points in the game we are forced to use light as a weapon to hold back the enemies as if Torque was best mates with Adam Wake. However this concept is criminally underplayed as the majority of the game is pretty bright and this gameplay mechanic only appears to work when it is forced on the player for a specific way to progress. The idea that the enemies do not like the light could have been removed altogether and this would barely change the game. The combat encounters are pretty back to back with a few puzzles and boss fights thrown in between once in a while, however it was early on in the game that I came to the realisation of that I misled myself as to what this game really was when I was given access to the biggest weapon of all. Talks rage mode. Show me why you're in here. I want to know. <laughs> Talk has a rage meter, and once full, would unleash his literal beast within. Like a hulking bane, Talk transforms into a physical manifestation of the rage and anger built up inside him to become a monster himself. In this form we are able to slash enemies with our blade arms, pierce them through a thrusting attack, or perform a ground punching attack that launches through the ground. The meter is built up by killing monsters and once activated the meter drains so we can only assume this form for a short time. The only way to get pulled out of this, other than the player choosing it themselves, is the mainliners injecting you with one of their syringes. This will end it. When going through the tutorial for this it mentions that when the meter drains something devastating would happen, so I was scared to let it run out. However, one time towards the end I was just eager to see what would happen, so I did let it drain out and all that happens is your life starts draining instead. This was a little anticlimactic considering the build up around letting the meter run out. There were also a few times where I transformed into the beast and I would get stuck on the environment around me, such as fences, which unfortunately did make the feature feel a little clunky, and I didn't actually use it all that much. When the transformation first happened though, I was actually genuinely shocked. I did not know this was in the game and it was at this point I realised this was going to be an action game with horror elements, as opposed to a horror game with some action sprinkled throughout. It was here when I was first doubting whether I would actually enjoy this game, not because I don't enjoy action games, of, of course I do, but because of my own doing, my own build up in my head that the suffering was some sort of incredibly intense horror game, all because of that time I spent in Blockbuster avoiding it like it was Covid-19. When I came to the realisation this was not the case I couldn't help but feel a little disappointed. I guess that's the power of video game box art for you, something that seems to have deteriorated as the years have gone by, but what it did not deteriorate was my interest in the game. Once I got a little deeper into it and past my previous expectations for it, what I found here was an enjoyable action game that whilst it suffers from some technical issues, I can see why this game was a success upon release and has somewhat gathered a cult following. 
I absolutely love the characters and the interactions between them, but the story itself on the surface is pretty weak as it's progressed by the cliched plot of Amnesia, with nothing really happening until the closing moments of the game when we find out what really happened to Talk's family. Talk! My diagnosis is complete! Your cure is at hand! Spoilers here for the end of the game. Before any ending, we have to fight the final boss, which is against an embodiment of Talk's persona. Symbolic of him facing himself for what he has done, and the bad ending sees Tork brutally killing his family like he was a man on the edge that just thought, fuck it, I hate family life. He kills his wife, drowns his son in the bath and throws the other one out the window. Then we see Tork kill the guy who comes to rescue him and he transforms into what we believe to be permanently into the creature form before running off into the woods. The neutral ending is perhaps even more harrowing than this though in that it's not just Tork killing his family but he accidentally kills his wife in an argument but this is witnessed by one of his sons, and raging at their father for taking away their mother, the son decides to get revenge by taking both his brother and himself away. He drowns his brother in a bathtub and kills himself by jumping out of the window, probably the only thing more morbid than Tork killing his whole family with his own hands. Tork then leaves the island by hijacking the boat of his rescuer and escaping on the run. And last but certainly not least, we have the good ending, which feels most canon within the game, as it shows the whole event was set up. Three men break into the home of Tork and kill his family, and leave Tork alive at the request of someone called the Colonel. Revenge for what happened in Eastwood Prison, something that is briefly referred to at the start of the game. That's Tork, the man himself. Word is he sheared half the Aryan Brotherhood over at Easton. So fucking what? And finally, though Tork is rescued and his knight in shining armor explains the prosecutor on Tork's trial as being indicted and he will get a new one. This ending creates an open-ended plot thread that there are people out there who want to punish Talk for something he did in the past, which opens up many new avenues. Will he pursue the killers and get justice for his family and the suffering he's endured? Or has he suffered enough? Well, his suffering this time around made quite a bit of money, so I guess he can be put through hell and back at least one more time. Yeah? <laughs>